Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Uh, good morning. How are you? Good? How are you? <laughs> hey, my name is Edward Austin Crouch. I hail from the area of Northeast Texas, God's country. Amen. That's my name. Names are important, aren't they? I remember when I found out what my name meant because I, I thought I was named after my step-grandfather because his name was Edward Applegate, and I thought I was named after my real grandfather, Austin Crouch, and, but I remember I was looking up my name one day, and, and I found out the word, the name Edward means prosperous guardian prosperous guardian. And I remember when I saw that word prosperous, I was going, <laughs> I got to figure that out, right? I got to figure out what that prosperous part means. And here's what I've learned over the years. Everything I've touched from leadership, working, starting businesses, they've always prospered. Maybe not into the millions, maybe not into building these huge international organizations, but it seems like everything that God has allowed me and called me to has prospered. Because see, names mean something, don't they? I mean, what's in a name? What's the big deal? Because I think names matter. In fact, we know that there are certain cities that have names like Philadelphia. Y'all know what the word Philadelphia means? What does it mean? City of love, right? Or how about Jerusalem? City of peace. Names mean something. In fact, if you look in Scripture and you find that names mean a whole lot more in biblical times than they do today, don't they? I mean, you go back and look at some of those names. In fact, I thought about bringing up some of the Old Testament names of, that, that parents named their children. And, and I thought, no, I'm not going to go there today. But, I mean, you know some of those names. It's like, holy cow, you really named your kid that? But, you know, our culture, names don't mean as much. I mean, in biblical times, they, they would, God would give them a name and they would name this child and it meant something. In our times we really find a name that just sounds cool, right? And that's not a hit on parents. It's just our cultures are different. And that's why so many nicknames are added years later because we'll find a nickname to add to them later in their life that better fits their character and their actions. But names are important. They matter. In fact, it even matters in our culture today because in our culture, you don't see anyone naming their baby Hitler, right? Right? Or Benedict Arnold. Anybody met a Benedict lately? Because names mean something, don't they? In biblical times, the name was often given to something that the name carried more weight than the actual thing it was named. I mean, there was so much around that. I think that's why when Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 26, he said uh, that, that he made God's name known to them and he and will make it known. He was talking more than about the word of God. He was talking about uh, that Jesus was going to unveil God's heart, his mind, his will, his character, his being, and all through the revelation of his name. From Genesis to Revelation, what we find is, is that the scriptures demonstrate the power of God's name. And here's the thing about God's names. You can't just take one name of God and encompass all the majesty and all the glory and, and all the victory and all those things. It takes so many names for us to comprehend who God is because names mean something. In fact, my dad used to tell me, son, don't you give our family a bad name, amen? Amen. And so over the next few weeks, here's what we want to do. We want to talk about the names of God. 
And before we can talk about the seven redemptive names of God, and by the way, if we preached on every name of God in Scripture, we would be here for the next five years, by the way, because that's about how long it would take to work from Genesis to Revelation. So what we've prayed through as elders is we, we want to teach you the seven uh, redemptive names of God this fall. But before we can get to the seven redemptive names of God, we really need to understand the three foundational names of God, because God has three foundational names that all the other names refer back to and keep coming to. And for instance, we're going to look over the next three weeks that he is our Elohim. He is our strong creator God, that he is our Jehovah, that he is a relational God, and he is our Adonai, the God who rules. And then out of that, we're going to look at those seven foundational names. And you know what? Names are important. Let me tell you how important names are. Did you know that in the Ten Commandments that God included a command about his name? Y'all ever remember that? In Exodus 20, verse 7, look at it. You probably recognize this. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, if you grew up in church, and like I did, it's that King James Version, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain, right? And maybe your mama was like my mama, that she recited that over and over again. My brother and I could be watching TV or hanging out, and, and one of us would finally get enough of the other and go, oh, my God, leave me alone. And mom could be six miles away and go, Edward Austin Crouch, don't you take the Lord's name in vain. I'm like, where did she come from? <laughs> and tens of millions of moms have said it, and yet people still Use God and Jesus in vain and use those words. In fact, we've even reduced it down in our age of social media to OMG. I know, I know. What's the big deal, right? It's just words. I mean, come on. But for some reason, God thought it was a pretty big deal about his name. Because right in the Ten Commandments, he put something in there. And listen, when you look at the Ten Commandments, they make sense. For instance, everybody gets thou shalt not murder, right? That's a good thing. And I hope you all honor that, right? Or how about this one? You shall not steal. You don't even have to be a Christian to say, that's a good thing, right? Or you don't commit adultery. Or how about this one? Remember the Sabbath. Wait, God's giving me a free day off? I'm in right? We get all that. But for some reason, if I texted you and said, OMG, did you see the Longhorns last night? All of a sudden, I'm in trouble with God. All of a sudden, that's an offense worthy of being written in stone next to do not murder. Wow. <laughs> I mean, what's in a name? What's the big deal, right? Must be a big deal because look at that second half of that verse in, chapter, in verse tw chapter 20, verse 7. Look at it. It says, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. By the way, it's the only commandment besides the second one that it concludes in or else. Don't do this or else. I mean, why is it so important? I mean, is there something to it? And I know what some of you are thinking. Ed, come on. It's just a name. It's just, it's just we're doing it. I mean, does this verse means something that we don't think it means or does it mean more than we think it means? I mean, why, why did God tell Moses, don't take the, my name in vain? Why did he feel so compelled to write that down that literally hundreds of years before Jesus' birth, he said, my name means something? I mean, were the Israelites kind of going through the, the desert and they were carving OMG on stones and trees? And I mean, is that why God said, stop? I don't know. See, here's what I do know. Is there everybody in the New Testament, and especially the New Covenant, especially if you hadn't been in church in a long time, and, and, and you're coming back to church, nobody likes religion, and nobody wants to go back to the Old Testament, and we shouldn't do that. But see, see, listen, the Ten Commandments were about God setting a people apart. They were, it was about relationship that God had chosen the, the Israelites. And he said, listen, I want to set you apart. And so I want to give you some things that are going to set you apart. And I want to invite you to be in relationship with me. And by you being in relationship with me, these are some things that we're going to set up covenant-wise for us to be in relationship with you. And remember, it all began in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. Look what it says. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt 
Egypt and out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. And here's what he was saying. He goes, listen, I'm different from all those false gods you saw in Egypt. I'm different than all the other false gods that other groups have. And so, listen, you need to understand that the tribal deities and all those things, they're really not gods at all. But I'm the one who saved you. Don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget your name because I'm going to set you apart so I don't want you acting like all the other ones. Because I want all of the known world to know that I am the God. And so God gave them, he basically said, listen guys, my name is my reputation. It's my reputation. You can't use my name the way other people use their God's names. No more. I'm setting you apart and I'm giving you my name so that my name will be my reputation on my people. And we get that, don't we? Because another, a person's name is their reputation. In fact, if someone makes it big that we admire, what do we say? Boy, they're really making a name for themselves, aren't they? We get that, don't we? Or if someone's not making good decisions, right? We'll go, man, they are really making a name for themselves. Because we get this, don't we? Because your name is your reputation. It's your character. It's a summary of everything you are. And, 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 you know, I love, I love studying business. And I love that. But it's your brand that when people hear Edward Austin Crouch, there are some people, sadly, in my journey that they don't have a very good thought about me. And I wish that weren't so because my name is my brand. And there's other people that they love my name. In fact, I tell some people, you tell them that you connect me and you, okay? Because I'm telling you, you connect us and you're going to get you somewhere. And other people are like, don't mention my name. Whatever you do, don't bring my name up, right? Because your name is your brand. It means something. Remember earlier in the story when God commanded Moses, you're going to go and you're going to bring my people out. And, and Moses was like, you know, God, I can't talk, I can't speak, I stutter and all that. And by the way, who, what am I even going to tell them who sent me, Right? And here's all God said. God said, I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. We're going to look at that later. Because he is the great I am. He always has been, always will be. And he doesn't depend on anyone or anything else to exist. In fact, he's the one who, who, who not only within his creation stands outside and above it. He's the creator. In fact, the weight of the universe is on his name. Look around what he did. But he has created quite a name for himself. Amen? Then 1,400 years later in John chapter 8, when Jesus was on the earth, he, denied, he identified himself too. He said, look, I am. In fact, he was reaching way back to Exodus and going, hey, you guys, you remember that guy Moses? Remember that guy that, that, that wrote the first five books of the Bible? And, and he was writing about me. I mean, Jesus not only was saying, I am, he says, I'm God in the flesh, and he walked the earth, he healed the sick, he, he raised the dead. I mean, he demonstrated his power over creation, and, and then he never sinned, and then he died for us, and three days later, he rose again. My goodness, did he ever create a name for himself, Amen. Names mean something. In fact, he taught his followers to ask everything in his name. What's in a name? It's everything. So the question comes in, if it was so important to be written in stone, right? And how do we misuse it? In other words, how do we disparage or dishonor God's name? Because we're going to be talking about a whole lot of names over these next few weeks. So how do we misuse them? Well, first, it's irreverent. To use God's name as a slang. I know some of you really want me to go there. So I don't want to disappoint you, okay? It's irreverent to use God's name as slang. It's interesting, out of all the famous people in history, the only names that get misused as slang or curse is God or Jesus. I mean, if you stub your toe, you know, George Washington! No, you don't, do you? <laughs> and I'm not even going to act it out. I mean, it's in my notes to say it. Otherwise, I don't even feel right about saying it. Because you know what you say sometimes, right, and what I say. I'm not trying to be real religious up here, okay, because I'm struggling with this. Because sometimes I get a little bit loose in this. And could it be 
that God and Jesus, I mean, we're not throwing out George Costanza or George Washington or we're not throwing out all these other names. It's God, Jesus. Could it be that the enemy is less concerned about the reputation of George than the reputation of Jesus? See, there's so many other ways to misuse it. But in Moses' day, that people would take an oath in the name of their God to get away with a lie. They would take an oath in the name of their God. They would use their little gods for all kinds of stuff, but they would use it in, in a way to lie about something, and that still happens today, doesn't it? You ever been in a conversation with somebody where you think they're lying? Maybe it's your kid. Maybe it's your coworker. Maybe it's your business partner, and you start kind of pushing them on, and all of a sudden they go, I swear to God I'm telling the truth. And you go, God, wow. I, 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 I mean, I still think he's lying, but I mean, he swore to God. And that, see how that works? The liar's claiming God's reputation for honesty, to mask his own dishonesty. And so we must never be flippant, throwing God's name around or using it for our gain. You know, in, in Moses' day, the, the Egyptians uh, would take and use their God's names to get power. They, they would call down curses on their enemies or they would call down blessings on themselves, but they would, they would leverage God's name for power. And so they, they literally, when God said, don't take my name in vain, don't use my name in a dishonored way. In other words, I am not your genie in a bottle. You can't just come to me and rub the bottle and say, God, I want, so you give. Or God, I don't like them, so you kill them, or at least just maim them really good, amen? Amen. <laughs> In the New Testament, hundreds of years later, people were still misusing the name of Jesus. I love this story in Acts chapter 19. If you've not read this and you think the Bible's boring, you've got to read this. And it's about several brothers that were driving out a demon. And so they go to drive out this demon and, they, and, they, and they're, they're trying this hocus pocus, abracadabra, going, oh, you can do it, you can do it. And finally the demon just looks at him and says, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out. And the demon looks at them when they say this. Because these guys wanted the power of the demons. They wanted the reputation. They wanted people to go, oh, that's a demon cast right there. And I love what the demon says. I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? And then it, what happens next? I know I probably shouldn't enjoy this. <laughs> but the man possessed by demons so thoroughly whipped these boys that they ran away bleeding and naked. And that's a whole lot worse than Edward Austin Krauss. Don't you take the Lord's name in vain. The demon-possessed dude whipped him. You see, in our day, in our day, the name of Jesus is used to gain power. Not so much over demons, but to bolster ourselves, to gain favor. We live in a city and a state and nation where it's just normal to call yourself Christian. It's just normal to claim, even in a culture that's hostile to the gospel, that's hostile to the name of Jesus, how many people still claim the name of Jesus? And in fact, it's so prevalent today that non-believers say that the disciples must have just made up this whole Jesus thing, must have just made up this whole Jesus down on the cross because they just wanted to be rich and famous. They just, they, surely they just made this up. I mean, it doesn't stand up. We know that. One, Christianity didn't become popular for hundreds of years later. I mean, how do you get rich when you're on the run, right? And, and yet, we know that these guys were so convinced that Jesus actually rose from the grave, that they were beaten for it, fired from their jobs, kicked out of their families, ostracized from their communities, thrown into jail for it, even killed for the name of Jesus. And yet... What would give them so much boldness? Simply. I mean, what, I, you know, I've, I've thought about this so much about people saying, oh, the disciples made it up, and Jesus, you know, you know. listen, if, if it wasn't real and they made it up, when they were getting the snot beat out of them, why didn't they go, time out, we made it up? <laughs> wouldn't you? Have you ever gotten in trouble for something that you didn't do and you're getting punished for it and you just go, I didn't do it. Time out. We made it up. Wow, they had seen it. 
They saw the resurrected Lord, and it wasn't some zombie creature, subhuman Jesus dragging up out of the grave. It was the glorified body of Christ. They will never die again. And they saw it and they believed. And here we are hundreds and thousands of years later that the gospel spread throughout the world that we're here today. And so in America, it's very popular to call yourself a Christian. In fact, people will identify with Christianity more than any other religion or political party or sports team. And they will identify with that name. In fact, we're coming into a season, I'm even scared to go into this, where politics that we'll hear more about God from politicians over the next year. I mean, nobody loves God more than when they're running for office, amen? Just relax. I know some of you are like, oh my gosh, I'm itching. You know, I'm, he's talking about politics. It's amazing how many political candidates would have us believe that God endorses their tax plan. Right? Or how about this, they, that God endorses our education plan, our health care plan, or the immigration plan. And you're really not going to like this because some of us even believe that God anoints one president over the other. All based on a party or a position. Now everybody hates me, right? <laughs> but listen to me. If we believe that God is sovereign, according to Daniel 2.21, that God removes one king and sets up another, then the Democrat or the Republicans both put there by God. I know I, you don't like that in a red area. But the truth is, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And I represent his name before I represent any other name. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. I know. I've had people walk out of here with the two sermons I've ever preached on politics in all of my 15 years. And I know nobody loves to hear that. But can I just be honest with you? Some of the most evil institutions of the world came from politicians who used God's name to feed their evil desires. Politicians endorsed slavery in America and the South. Politicians in the past endorsed Nazism in Germany. Politicians in the past endorsed apartheid in South Africa. But see, for us, we're too sophisticated for that, aren't we? Right now, since everybody's really uncomfortable, let me kind of dial it back a little bit. Remember when you were in college and you were that young single guy who pretended you were interested in God to get that girl? Remember that? Okay, maybe that's too close. Or how about that Christian young guy who's having trouble winning that certain Christian girl? So he tells her, God spoke to me. you're going to be my wife. Well, how do you argue with that? I mean, if God spoke to you, I mean, it's like, well, I guess I'm going to be his wife, right? Or, or I love this one. I went to East Texas Baptist University, and, and some of you know I'm recovering Baptist, but I, I, as I was going there, we used to always hear that line, well, God told me we're to break up. Really? You're going to blame God because you... Anyway, okay, so see, or maybe you leverage God to get a job, and, and, and then there's this whole thing about me preaching up here today because, you know, I, I really, there's something about me today because I've said some stuff that's pretty offensive already, and so now my insecurities are working in me and because I really want you to like me, and, and I really want you to walk out of here going, dude, that dude can preach, and, and yet even as I admit that, I, I want you to be impressed with my humility, and... Uh, <laughs> So the very thing I really want to do, the honor and glorify God, I can't because my motives aren't pure. And sometimes I have to ha have that check at the very thing I don't want to do and misuse and, and to make myself look good. I, I know I shouldn't be all about Edward and, and wanting y'all to come up and pat me on the back and give me an applause and, and all that. And I love that. But who's that about? That's about me. I can't live up to honoring the Lord's name because I just keep doing it. No matter how many times I try, the heart is to live up to Christ, to do great things to him, for him, to overcome a habit. And I failed. And yet here's the twisted thing. Even when I succeed, and I've had all these successes in my journey of ministries and businesses and all these things that I've done, 
And people do applaud me, and, and, and you do come up and say, Edward, you're doing a great job, and then my motives are pure at the moment, but yet I really like the fact that you're applauding and laughing for me, and I really like you're patting me on the back that one day I wake up, and even in my successes, I'm realizing what I'm doing is for the applause of man and has nothing to do with God. Even in our successes, we fail to live up to his name. I mean, how could any of us live up to that name? I mean, if the way to prevent misuse of God's name is to live up to it, we're in a lot of trouble, aren't we? How can you live up to the name above every name? How can we live up to one name, let alone all the names? So maybe, maybe God's not saying we live up to it, but we live out of it. I mean, let me say that again. Maybe God's not saying we live up to it, because we'll never attain it, but we live out of that name. We live out of that name. Maybe it's not a status to attain or words or phrases we say, but an identity that we understand who he is and we live out of that identity. Knowing full well we'll never measure up outside of him. Isaiah 62 verse 2, look what it says. And again, God's talking to his nation, his people that he set aside. And he said, the nations will see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you will be called a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. And what's that new name? Look at verse 5. He says, as a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder, talking about God, marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Did you catch that? As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, that the new name God is going to give us is his name. I never forget when she took my name. When she, I remember the first time I saw her sign my name. Mm. I loved it. I did. I, lo- I still love to see her sign my name. And here's what God's saying. There's so many of us that God's going to give us a new name, that he's given us a new name. And there's so many ways to misuse God's name, and we're all guilty. And the only way to honor his name, now listen to me, this is big, only way to honor his name and to use it correctly is to take his name as our own because we can't live up to it but we can live out of his name by living as a part of his family being brought in being adopted wearing the name living out of the name when we take his name as the bride of Christ he gives us this beautiful wedding gift called the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us that empowers us that we do all things in the name of Jesus as he teaches us through his word to be that spirit-led community. See, why are names important? Because names mean something. So what's in a name? Maybe it's not a what, it's a who. Because who bears the name? The name above all names. Who is the family of God? Who bears that name? Well, can I just tell you honestly, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you do. And you do, and you do, and so do you. If you've come to a place in your journey where you've surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, then you've been given a new name. You've been given the name of Jesus. Go be a little Jesus. Go be a little Jesus. You are a little Jesus. Go be a little Jesus. Go on and be a little Jesus because you now have taken his name. Live out of that. Live out of that name. You can't live up to it. Can you die and rise, raise yourself from the dead? I don't think so. So live out of that name because you don't have to. You see, what's in a name? Everything. Who bears the name? We do. So how is God inviting us to respond? Well, first, you need to understand that he's inviting us to rest in his name because you have nothing to prove. You don't need to make a name for yourself. See, that's what I learned about four and a half years ago. For years, Edward strived to make a name for himself. And I finally realized all the striving and all that I was trying to do did not matter. I had nothing to prove because everything had been proven for me on the cross. And he had given me a new name. And now all I have to do is live out of that name. I don't have to have all the answers anymore. Somewhere along the way, I thought I had to know everything. Wow, how self-centered is that, right? 
But how easy it is to get there, isn't it? How easy it is to live out of that. That God has something bigger for me. That there's nothing bigger than being a part of the bride of Christ and wearing his name. The second thing is, is God invites us to bear his name. Amen? To carry the name of Christ through the great commission that he's invited us to be a part of that. Can you imagine the possibilities if we began to wear the name and bear the name for Hawkins America? For Holly Lake Ranch, for, for Quitman, for Mineola, for our neighbors, our coworkers. Can you imagine if we begin to wear that name and bear that name to that cat you work with that takes the Lord's name in vain 50 times a day and you are so repulsed by that if you begin to live out of that and instead of avoiding him that you would begin to invite him in to the name above every name. Or that woman that's always judging people. OMG, 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 OMG. It just drives you crazy that you grab her out twice a week, that you're calling people out on Facebook. What if we were less about condemnation and more about invitation? Come on. What if we were less about condemnation? What if in the midst of all of that man striving to be somebody, all that woman striving to make a name for herself, what if we invite them into a life where they would take the family name? Come on. And we would invite them to take the family name. And listen, you can't invite somebody you're always judging. You can't invite somebody to take your name that you're mad at all the time. I know. So what if we were more about invitation than condemnation? That means maybe you would sit down with that coworker that's always taking the Lord's name in vain and hear his story and then share your story of how God changed you. Or what if you invited them here on Sunday morning to a safe place to hear about the claims of Christ, a safe place to investigate. By the way, we have room now, amen? We have two services there's enough for y'all to bring a whole row if you want to. And y'all can bring half a row. And gosh, John, you got a whole row too you got to fill up. Remember those Baptist Church of Christ days? We're going to fill the pews. Remember those? We're going to add some cheers to y'all's row though because you're a former pastor, okay? So because um, you're, you're going to be held more responsible. You remember that? What if we invited them here? For them to figure out that they don't have to wear a suit. They can wear shorts and sandals. In fact, we just prefer they wear clothes. Come on. Amen. Maybe you invite them to your small group or, you know, we're going to have that fall festival thing come up where about 3,000 people are on our campus. And what if you just invited them here to have a bowl of Catholic chili out back and sit down? Well, the Catholics bring the chili. I mean, don't y'all, some, some of y'all were trying to figure out what, what, we partner with churches and we partner with churches and they all come here together. And so um, the Catholic church brings chili and serves it. Okay. So you just sit down and have a conversation over a bowl of chili, amen? I'm going to try to get out of that really quick. <laughs> you see, listen, I, Summit, we've been known as a church that loves people. And, and I, I confess to you that sometimes we're too relaxed. But we've been called to wear the name. And that's that same name that pursued you and loves you and all your stuff. And all my stuff. And now he's invited us to bear that name, not so we can go around saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. But we're inviting others to take the family name. And this is your church. This isn't Edwards Church. The older I get, the more I realize my time is limited. And one of these days, there will be another man that stands on the stage and leads this congregation. And so it's not about me, it's about the name of Jesus that we project in this community and we carry in this community and we win others and we do that by simply inviting them. It doesn't take a big step, but it does take a step. And it doesn't have to be a huge step, but it does to be something, right? Amen? And do you know the average first-time guest is invited to church over seven times before they ever come once? And I know we're in the Bible Belt. Most people are like, yeah, I'll be there. Just keep inviting them. Keep loving them. 
Go buy a pumpkin spice latte for $13 at Starbucks and tell, share your story. <laughs> Amen? I don't even like pumpkin spice, but anyway. <laughs> next few weeks, we're going to talk about the names of God. And you know this passage in Exodus. Some of us look at the commands, don't do this, don't do that. Don't do that. You, you don't really know what the Ten Commandments were. An invitation. It was an invitation to be in relationship with God. And see, we, we turn them into these rules. But very honestly, Danielle and I have rules in our marriage. Now, we didn't write it down in stone. But if either one of us violate that rule, we know it, don't we? Because that's what happens in relationship. And you see, God was inviting the children of Israel into a relationship. While they were saved from Egypt, we're saved from death. That while they received the law, we receive life. That while they, were, they received manna every day that soured within 24 hours, you and I have the blood and the body of Christ. That feeds us. And I know, I know some of you are like, I don't understand that. Well, listen, you don't have to fully understand how the body and the blood feeds you. But what he's inviting you into is that he said, listen, it was by my body that I was broken and my blood that was spilled for your redemption and your forgiveness of sins. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took that piece of bread and he said, this is my body. Guys, every time you eat, Every time you gather together, I want you to remember that it was my body that was broken for you. And after he had taken the bread and blessed it and gave it to him, he then took the cup and he said, boys, ladies, this is the cup of my blood that was poured out for you. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. You want life? It's not found in your name. It's found in the name. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to take the body and the bread, the cup, and we're going to learn about who he is and what he does. But right now, I want to invite you this morning to take the body and take the cup. At the end of every service now, we respond. It's an invitation it's not the invitation maybe you grew up with, like I grew up with, the Billy Graham style invitation. Y'all remember that? The buses will wait, you come, and they sing 37 verses of Just As I Am, and all the visitors are wanting to leave out the back. No, 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 this is, this is so simple. Because when we realize God's inviting us into an invitation, we just get to respond to that. When my sweetheart looks at me and says, get over here, I respond to that. Amen? Why? Because I'm in relationship with her. And I want to be near her. Well, that's what God's inviting you to do, is to come over here and take my name. So if you don't know Jesus this morning, I would invite you not to come take communion. I would invite you to receive Jesus Christ by confessing him as your Lord and your Savior and letting him come into your heart. If you've done that before, I want to invite you to come at your own discretion because some of you need to deal with some relational issues. And I don't want you to take the cup or the bread in a way that would bring condemnation on you because you haven't dealt with some things you need to deal with. Amen? Come on. I know we don't talk about this very often. But every once in a while I just need to, I need to come in and be daddy, okay? So I invite you to respond today by taking communion. And maybe you wait today. I don't take it every week. There's some weeks where I've got to deal with my own heart, amen? But I get to be at both services so I can take it next service, amen? Okay? There's some Sunday mornings I just can't because my motives are jacked up. So I invite you to respond today. I'm going to ask the band to come back, and I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and I'm going to pray over you. Can we do that? And then after we've prayed, I'm going to invite you to come and take communion. Some of our prayer guys will be here at the front, and... Uh, if you need someone to pray with you or you want someone to lead you to Christ, we'd love to do that this morning. So, Lord, I love you. I thank you that we can enter into a series, God, that has so much depth. There's, there's a whole lot here, Lord, as even we were praying this morning. Um, God, there's a lot of meat here. And so, God, I pray that we wouldn't take so much meat that we would choke, that, God, we would pace ourselves to learn and to to ingest you and, and to be good disciples. 
Lord, I pray for the one that sits in this room today that, God, they don't know you. God, would you give them courage right where they sit to confess you as the Lord of their life. God, maybe they need to come to this altar and be prayed over. That God, that maybe they need to come to this altar and be led to you. And God, as we take communion, I pray that we would do this in a way that's worshipful to you, that honors you, that honors the name that is above every name. I love you. And we ask it in that strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Let's respond. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen, and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day, and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.